That's true. Good afternoon. Welcome to the October 23rd Administrative Committee meeting. Um, first item on the agenda, approval of Administrative Committee August 28th minutes. There weren't more of them, but uh, they look good to me. Yeah. It wasn't a lot. <laughs> Those are old ones, yes? Announce us. Why? People at the meeting with you. Well, introduce, introduction. Okay. <laughs> I just felt like we, we never. Well, they all know us. <laughs> well, I just felt like we don't do that at our city council's meetings, so I didn't know if we needed to do that at our, I haven't done that at any other commission meetings or committee meetings, so it I didn't. It seems to be tradition. Oh, a tradition. Oh, okay. Well, at the table is <laughs> city supervisor and three council members. Okay. <laughs> um, minutes are okay? Yep. August 28th? Okay, great. Item two, Tom Pacarelli, come on up. AT&T Amendment to Wireless Communication Facility Agreement. All right. So this is just an amendment to an existing contract um, for AT&T of putting additional um, equipment on the resident street water tank. Um, this should generate about uh, $2,880 annually. And um, this is the plans have gone through engineering as well as legal, and that has been approved. And we're just looking for approval to put this through to council. Okay. Either one of you have any questions? Just that it's part of the co-locating ordinance that we have in the city and uh, fits the, well there. Good use of property. Prevent cell towers popping up like weeds. So, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Yeah, that was my question. I figured um, since this is a request, are there any others in the pipeline that looks like that might be coming our way? Is this? Not that I know of. Oh, okay. But I can find out for you. Yeah, I just thought, I thought, you know, this seems to be just <laughs> kind of really what's being said, that we're starting to have more cell towers come up. So I didn't know if I mean, we have a certain amount or, yeah. It's sporadic. It depends on uh, new technologies and those sorts of things. Uh, engineering goes through them all to make sure that the tanks are able to um, sustain them without damage to the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, we've had times when the council passed the initial uh, cell tower co-location ordinance, then we saw a big rush to try and co-locate on buildings. Yeah. You'll notice on uh, Theophilus Tower there are a bevy of cell towers on there, um, or cell receptors I guess you'd call them, right? Something along those lines. Something along those lines. <laughs> um, and you see them on all of our elevated tanks, except for Vista, which is currently being um, engineered, is it not? I believe so. I believe so. So uh, it's just as more services are provided or new providers come into the, into the city, uh, they usually ask the city first, and that's how we end up getting these. So I don't know that you're going to find any more in the hopper, because usually when Jesse gets that request, he starts the process, and then it comes to you. I'm yeah, mostly just curious at, because there's more people with that need the services and more mm -hmm. people getting phones, and I just kind of wondered if there was that beginning to happen around here. Yeah, and I think that's their step forward into mm -hmm. trying to get more coverage. I'm not exactly sure what they're going to do with it. I just know that it, that's probably what they're what they're trying to accomplish. Oh, okay. And even the aesthetics of it in, on the back, it's it's pointing towards uh, Moscow Mountain, so um, a lot of people aren't even going to see it. Yeah. I wondered if the aesthetics are changing, too. I know when I've been down in other parts of the country, they're making towers look like certain types of trees. And but Yeah. Are, they, are we starting to see that around here at all? I don't know if they're going to continue to do something like that or if they're if they're going to do stuff like that, but... I guess that's people wanting them to blend in, you know, more in the urban better. setting, sort of. Yeah. We have two different types of towers around town besides the ones co-located. You have the, not lattice towers, but the pole towers with, with the external. And then there are two towers that the, the uh, infrastructure is within the pipe itself. One's mm -hmm. down along Highway 95, uh, just above the entrance to... Um, by City North American, I believe there's one behind the East Side Marketplace, if I recall. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And we have all this stuff mapped, right? And is I that believe, yeah. And so this ordinance that you all are talking about, the co-location ordinance, when was that? Do you remember? Oh, it's been around for a while. Co-location yeah. policy was policy. done. What was that? Uh, 
My recollection is it was it was about ten years ago. I think it was somewhere in two thousand four. I think it was on the agenda too. Yeah, something like that. Okay. I put that in the agenda, I think. Yeah, two thousand one. There you go. This is okay. back when Dale Pernula was our community development director. Well, just because it seems like th this is changing so much, and I just th I had just wondered, are there more requests because more people are using? Yeah, they've I been kind of spotty over the years. They kind of come in a little bit, and then they do nothing for a while. And I assume it's just because the the cell providers kind of over antenna. And then as the bandwidth gets eaten up, then they have to go again and put in another batch. So it just comes in surges. Okay. Um, would you all like this on consent agenda? or? I think so. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Our third item is Walmart Community Grant Application Shop with a Cop, Alyssa Anderson. And Chief Fry. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> um, this would be the second time we've came before you with this request. Um, Walmart has a community foundation grant that we can apply for that supports this um, Shop with the Cop program. It's a national program, and last year um, Shane Keene, one of our officers, um, coordinated and put everything together and then we applied through Walmart and a actually what they do is they provide us with um, last year we had $75 gift cards um, and I think we had 30 children that each received one and then they were paired with an officer and they were able to buy gifts for them for their all their family and then possibly for themselves too and then the gifts um, were wrapped at Walmart with some of their staff also so um, it's a matter of going online and filling out the Walmart application and then the store manager it goes for the foundation and then the store manager um, approves it usually and so um, we're just trying to get an earlier start on it because last year um, I think we actually got approved by the foundation the day before the event. So we wanted to make sure that we got this taken care of ahead of time this year. So, yeah. And I'll let Chief Fry kind of tell you a little bit about the interaction of the event. gives us an opportunity to um, be with kids and get them, let them see law enforcement in a different light. Yeah, yeah. And we go through the schools to pick the families. They help us um, with that. And it's across Latah County. We're also collaborating with every law enforcement agency in the area, ISP, Fish and Game, Latah County. And we spend about four hours with the kids, and we just shop and have a good time with them. And then uh, Subway provides um, a breakfast sandwich for them as well. So we feed them while we're there, and it's just a good time. Yeah, and the parents go with you too? Um, they can, or we just have a desi we get a number from them uh -huh. and then as soon as the kids are done shopping we'll call the parents say okay. you can come pick them so up so they're like yay they get to yeah. shop on their own that makes them feel really yeah great. is there an age range um up to i believe sixth grade we're trying to keep it in that grade school intermediate yeah mm -hmm. younger oh. and we had we had schools from i think 10 schools participate last year and they referred one or two kids yeah yeah sure john oh uh, yeah mm. you mentioned the other organizations that get involved and I think that's great however at the end of it all do we still need more money no that's a pretty good chunk of money actually for this and I believe Lake Dock County is putting in for a $500 grant this year so we'll have a total of possibly three thousand dollars to uh, and we may even have a few more kids because of that so um, okay so we're all right we're all right okay John, we also have another program here in town and, and the community the city contributed back when we had the nonprofit foundation grants or nonprofit um, applicants, but there's um, Christmas for kids. Yeah. And so a lot of the I think they do a, a lot of outreach and they do a really good program too to make sure that um, any of the kids I think that may not have their parents may not have the ability to purchase gifts um, mm. are really getting involved and I think we do a really good outreach program for for Christmas for the or for the holiday season for those things. Right. And there's Did, no match of city funds for this either. No, I was just kind of curious. Um, after, <clears throat> um, do you take pictures and can you use social media to? We do actually, um, and we'll put it on our Facebook site and stuff. And I think the last 
Uh, one of the main ones we put, we had a picture of all the law enforcement that were involved. Mm-hmm. So we had us all in a big circular. We put that out there as well. So we And the schools would love to, then you can, another way to get to those families, other families, because then the, I would think for next year, if you're thinking about this, then we can get some other uh-huh. families that might not have been able to participate this year. If you did 30 last year, is it that the same number? You did mm-hmm. 30 again. Yeah, unless Latah County gets their grant, if they get their grant, the number may go up oh. um, a little bit, but it'll be right around 30. And the officers have worked with Health and Welfare, too, so um, they make referrals along with the schools, yeah. so we get a pretty good idea of um, those that are most in need. Yeah, it's kind of fun to do something fun. Yeah. 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 It is. Did you have anything else? I didn't have anything other than I think it's a great program, and I think we should go forward with it and do it. And I also think we should put this on the regular agenda just to enhance the PR. Absolutely. I agree with you. So we'll put it on regular agenda. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You can bring some of the examples of things gonna, you shop for. Can Emily come up, or do you want to stay? We can grab another chair here. Let me get to that. All right, so the fourth item is the 2018 Idaho Child Passenger Safe. Grant. So, oh, good. A third. And who are you? Hi. Hi. So this year, um, we are um, bringing forth the, almost the same program as we had last year. There's a little bit of change. Um, we apply for a certain amount for car seats, and then we have some training. And I think attached to your um, agenda or your staff report, you had an outline of all of the goals and deliverables that are included. Um, the number of seats, um, it, it just depends upon kind of what the need is. Marie usually has a real good handle on what the community needs, and some of the seats are a little more expensive depending upon the type that are purchased and the age ranges and those types of things. But um, this is a program that Marie has headed up for us since she's since it started many years ago, and she does an excellent job with it. Um, so ITD really just needs basic information from us, and we provide that in this letter. Um, we also have to have um, a list of the activities we're going to provide and the certifications and um, the types of media and outreach we're going to do. And as you can see on our budget, we have a, a total request of or a total project cost of 10700 and um, that includes... Uh, 1,200 in in in-kind staff time from the um, um, police department, and 9,500 is really the request that we'll be asking for from ITD, and that includes the stipends in the training and the car seats. And so we'll let Marie and Officer, I want to say... I almost called you Officer Marie. I apologize. No, that's okay. That's, that's what I always call you. <laughs> you can tell us your official title. Um, Officer Miller's. Um, Officer all right, Miller. Thanks, Ms. Miller. I blinked. I'm yeah. Sorry. Did you um, want to say some stuff? So, oh, so uh, actually, Art Lindquist, Sergeant Lindquist, is the one who started the program. Oh, it is. Okay. Here Great. at Moscow Police Department. And so he gets the credit for that. And he also was instrumental in um, raising funds, for those of you that are new, um, to buy our car seat trailer um, and equip it with everything we need. And um, uh, an ISP trooper who has since um, died of cancer, um, Stan, uh, was, I don't remember his last name. Wiggins. Yes, Stan Wiggins um, and Art worked together to uh, um, build the trailer and get it equipped and all that. Mm-hmm. And it was in down in Lewiston, but under under a um, memorandum of understanding, we now have it here and we maintain it and then we use it to uh, go out to our events. So, just wanted to get that on. Record. And 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 the Officer New Bill Safety Fair is this part of that in some way? So it kind of is. Um, when um, John Kimberling and I started the Kids Safety Fair yeah. many, many moons ago, um, we did my half of it, like my part was a car seat check, and his, he did everything else. And so it actually, we started the Kids Safety Fair to do a car seat check. Mm-hmm. And then added, since it's just added and added and added. And so, yeah, the uh, car seat check is a big part of the Kids Safety Fair. Um, it's just one of the events that we do for the car seat program, though. Um, we do a couple of events in Lewiston, um, sometimes three. Um, we do events here, one in Pullman, 
Um, I'd like to branch out and get out into the county more, but that's going to depend on if I can get someone at the county certified as a tech. So um, the, the whole car seat program, if you're not familiar with it, um, I can just kind of briefly tell you what it is. Um, we get the grant from the state, and that is to, um, the big push is to certify technicians. And a um, certified car seat safety technician is someone who goes through four-day training, and it qualifies them to teach a parent how to correctly install and use a car seat. Um, it's, a, it's a really, really um, all-encompassing training. It's really hard. Um, I've had people leave in tears. I've had people not come back after the first day. Um, it's, yeah, it's a challenging class. Um, but once that person's certified, then we send them out to do checks wherever they work or live. Um, we have a number of unaffiliated techs who just are parents that are interested and, um, and spend their own personal time and money to do car seat checks throughout the county and throughout the area. Actually, our district, District 2, goes from the top of Lataw County all the way down to Grangeville. Oh, wow. um, so we cover a lot of area. Um, we're also part of a Safe Kid coalition that includes a Soton County and Whitman County. So we're, you know, we have a lot of people that work together. Um, there are six um, instructors. We do a uh, big training in June, uh, May and June, and we kind of the end last day of the training is the kids' safety fair. So we've got an instructor in um, Colton. We've got one in Hooper, which is way out the heck in the middle it's of nowhere. Way out there. Yeah, um, we've it's got not even one. Wash yeah, yeah, almost um, one. Uh, then three in Moscow and one in Lewiston. So we have a big range of, of experience and expertise to call on. And um, we've been trying to, you know, branch out with our technicians to get them out in, you know, more and more technicians. And that's a push of the state, too, is not necessarily to, um, for us to do a lot of car seat checks, but for us to train technicians to go out and do more car seat checks. Okay. So, so that's what we've been trying to focus on. What's the duration of a certification? It's two years. And then you can research, and there's a bunch of stuff you have to do to research. Um, for the technicians who don't have an agency, we assist them financially with their certification fees uh, because they're giving up their own time. Um, so with the blessing of um, ITD down in Boise, um, we assist them with that. Uh, most of our technicians are affiliated with an agency, like I am. Um, St. Joe Hospital, um, Valley Medical, Syringa, a hospital in Grangeville, um, Pullman PD, uh, Pullman Fire, uh, Pullman Hospital, Gritman. Um, about the only agency we don't have that I really want is um, Lata County Sheriff's Department. Uh, we have now an instructor at the fire department, um, having him jump ship to the <laughs> fire department. Um, so uh, the program has grown a lot since um, it started. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you because I wanted to put this on regular agenda too. I don't know what they think yet, but um, that's the kind of thing that those numbers people mm -hmm. like to understand, especially when you know you all are working so hard on something that's important, which is so. I have safety. some yeah. interesting numbers to share yeah. with you. In 2015, um, we did 238 car seat checks. So throughout the whole district, too, mm -hmm. um, we did 238 car seat checks. Um, in 2016, we did 472 car seat checks. Doubled. Yeah. Almost doubled. And that's just people going to participate when they know you're that's having... That's everything. That's people coming to the police department to get a car seat check, um, people coming to an event to get a car seat check, mm -hmm. um, a technician going to someone's house, well, although I don't encourage that. It does happen sometimes. Um, that's all of the um, documented checks that we did. Okay. So it doesn't include... Um, like the fire department in Pullman or um, any of that, the stuff in Pullman. This is just numbers for Idaho. Okay. Because this is from the yearly report that I do for Boise. Uh, they want like us to total everything. Yeah. We did, and if you, I actually broke that down last year. The number of seats checked at events last year was 140. Um, individual checks were 332. Wow. So we did a lot more checks individually than we did... Um, even at the events, yeah. And a big part of that is our people at Nimipu Health. Um, they go out and do so many checks, and they they donate or they they pull in a lot of donations, and they distribute <laughs> a lot of car seats. 
And now there's a different cart because they've really specialized per weight. So now people are moving out. You know, you think you have a car seat until they're six or until they're nine or whatever, but now there's all the interim car seats along the way too, right? And there are changes. Um, there's been a lot of changes. changes yeah. um, I think the trend is more to high weight seats, mm -hmm. which will um, accommodate a child longer. So you can, it a actually is theoretically possible if you want to spend the money mm -hmm. to buy one car seat for your child. And I'll just give you an example. Um, the Sunshine Radian goes from 5 to 80 pounds. So you can have it rear-facing for an infant until, I think, 45 pounds or so. And then you have to turn it around forward-facing, and the kid can stay in it until the, in a harness until they're 80 pounds. Wow. Um, and that car seat actually has a longer lifespan because of that. It's also a solid metal body, mm -hmm. not plastic. So there's been a lot of um, advances in technology, um, and people like that. They like to take advantage of it. On the same token, the cheap seats, the basic seats, have um, improved as well. So when I first started as a technician, um, it was the usual car seat would go to 40 pounds, forward-facing. Now, the usual basic model, the one that anyone can go out and afford, um, goes rear-facing to 35 or 40 pounds and forward facing to 65 pounds. So there's been great improvements um, all around for your basic car seat as well as your high-end car seats. Uh, but we are seeing uh, more high-end car seats. And uh, that's one thing that I purchase is um, a number of high-end seats. And it's mostly for um, handicapped kids, um, whether it's a temporary handicap or a long-term handicap. Um, just as an example, we were at an event down in Lewiston and uh, it was 107 degrees. It was so hot. But we were just getting finished up, and this lady in this ancient station wagon drove in. And she goes, are you guys done? And I'm like, oh, you're going to regret this, Miller. I said, what do you need? And she had a 12-year-old boy with cerebral palsy in a seatbelt. It was her grandson. And she said, I went and I just took him because of his meth-addicted mother. And she said that he had a special needs seat, but the mother took it and sold it. She says, I have nothing for him. Well, I had bought a Graco Nautilus, which is a higher end seat, um, goes harness to, I think this one went harness to 80 pounds. And we were able to fit him in the seat and get a much better fit, and he was much safer. Yeah. So we can do that kind of thing for a family like that, where the kid goes away safe, and we didn't take any donations. Usually we'll ask for a donation. Um, so it feels good, you know, to be able to get a child like that mm -hmm. into a seat that is going to keep him safe when, through no fault of his own, you know, here he's riding in a, just a seatbelt where he would have been so injured in the event of a crash. Mm -hmm. So um, we use the technology to our benefit and to the benefit of the kids as often as we can. Okay. This is good. So any other questions or anything? No. Oh. Yeah, so plan on Monday night, I guess. Yeah. Well, I will unfortunately not be able to be here. Oh. Um, I have to go to Eugene, okay. Oregon. So, so, so what we'll probably do is we'll partner with the fire department because um, Dan Ellenwood, who presented last year, is one of the techni technician um, instructors. Oh, right. So he'll come and I'll okay. be there as well. But um, I think what also needs to be highlighted here, and Marie doesn't highlight this because she doesn't necessarily want it to be known, but um, from Carmen, Karma, um, she's from Lemhi County. So they actually sent an article out through their paper because of the program that Marie puts on. Uh -huh. And here's a quote. She says, I have to say Marie runs a very tight ship and is spot on. One of the best, if not the best, in the state. So what we're producing here is one of the best programs, and they're actually modeling off of us oh, um, cool. across the state on how these programs should be run. So that's a huge kudos to the police department, but also to Marie for continuing that um, passion and continuing to move that forward. So I think that's um, a great kudo to her. Yeah. Thanks. Make sure you Thanks. say that at our council meeting. Chief. <laughs> I will. Except council meeting is not this Monday. Not this Monday. Sorry, November. Oh, it's yeah. oh, that's right because this is the fifth Monday. So actually, our meeting is what? What's oh, the then. date? November what? Six. I'll probably be. Yeah. So all right. That's good. So that'll be good. All right. So you'll be able to be at the council meeting. All right, so thanks. We'll put this on our religion. So, and I, I just want to say, yeah. what you have here in front of you in this packet is really just a uh, <laughs> in, the, in the pot of what all really goes on behind this because this just purchases new seats 
it doesn't talk about all of the um, the checks and everything that they do. Well, a four-day um, course it. is pretty intense. Yeah, I didn't mention yeah. Holy it because I wanted, I wanted to because I thought this was a really impressive number. Yeah. We gave away 94 seats in 2015 to kids that needed a safe seat. In 2016, we gave away 220. Wow. And part of that was um, Cherie at uh, ITD gave us Ten thousand dollars. Additional, additional, yeah. So she almost doubled the grant for us last um, 2016. Because she's how effective and, uh, it is. Yeah, and the the grant this year is for five thousand dollars for mm -hmm. seats. Um, but the reason why it's less this year is because she doesn't know how much money she's going to get from NHTSA because of budgeting issues with the federal government. Who said if um, they get more, which they probably will, um, they'll shoot it our way. Mm. So. That's and what really happens too sometimes at the end of the the program, yeah. if they have remaining funds, because Marie does such a great job with the program, they'll ask yep. oh, that's the so Moscow cool PD to, to take some additional funds and get it out. Yeah, great. And we make them, you know, twist our arm to. Take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much thank for you. presenting. Thank you. See you. See you on November sixth. Thank that. you. And I think. You know, we got a report. We have. A report, uh, Fort Russell Historic District Status Report, Michael Ray. Hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. Hi. Well, we had uh, received some excellent news uh, recently from the National Park Service that the uh, Fort Russell uh, Historic District has been approved to be amended. Oh, wow. And so I thought I'd come and, uh, you know, just because this is uh, kind of a multi-year project, we started it uh, around 2013, 2014. Uh, and it's taken us this long to go through the process and, you know, multiple grants. Uh, I figured I have a pretty brief PowerPoint, but I just wanted to kind of recoup uh, where we've come from. So uh, looking at the original district uh, outlined in red at the center of your screen, uh, 116 sites uh, were originally uh, contained within that district, and it was 1980 when it was first designated as a historic district. Um, as you can see, at the onset of uh, the Historic Preservation Commission looking at uh, amending the district, obviously it's, you know, 30 plus years old. Uh, so a lot has changed. Also, uh, if you look at the lines, you know, it kind of zigzags in and out of different areas. And, uh, you know, we're looking for a more of a symmetrical district, and that was part of it. Uh, to know actually when you're in the district and when you're not. And also looking at some of uh, the prominent features like the McConnell Mansion, you know, is, is right here. It's outside of the district. And, I mean, we have our district logo that's the McConnell Mansion. <laughs> so, you know, Methodist Church, uh, 1912 <coughs> Center, some of these uh, prominent uh, institutional buildings are not within the district. And so, you know, those are the things that we were, were looking at, you know, you have to be at least 50 years of age in order to be declared historic. And so uh, 1930 was uh, kind of the cutoff, so you had a lot of uh, bungalows that weren't included in that, which make up, you know, quite a bit of the district as well. Um, so we applied. We, we funded the majority of this out of uh, federal government dollars. That was a certified local government program. 2013-2014, uh, we received uh, money from the CLG grant program. Uh, we initially started with a reconnaissance survey of the neighborhood. So you start with the original district, and then you expand it to look at the, the periphery of the, the surrounding area. Uh, and then you distill it a little bit further uh, towards the end for the district boundary. So we selected AD Preservation. Uh, they're out of Spokane, Washington. And, and there was really three phases. First phase was survey the existing district. Uh, looking at the periphery of phase two, uh, we looked at 320 sites. So they did a lot of work, you know, 320 plus the existing 116, you know, well over 400 sites that they had surveyed as part of this. Uh, and then they prepared the National Register nomination as part of the third. So um, initially, 
you know, you have the existing district in red, and then this was the, the study area where they conducted the survey. So they went all the way down to 6th Street, uh, all the way over to uh, properties on the east side of Hayes Street, uh, D Street, and then um, looking at um, like Washington there on the west side. And this is the information that was contained within each of these sites, you know. So it's taking pictures, it's uh, giving it a proposed designation, whether it's contributing or non-contributing to the district, uh, and giving it a narrative as to whether or not, uh, you know, it, it fits in with the district or not. And so they did this for every one of those sites within the, the survey. So then uh, from that information, it was, uh, a little bit clearer as to where the the district boundary should go, and that uh, is where we had reduced it from the from the uh, reconnaissance survey blue line uh, distilled down to this green line, and you know it it met the need as far as more symmetrical of a district in the northwest corner it remained largely the same, and that was mainly just because of topography. You know it drops off, and then the character of the district or the character of the area is, is compromised a little bit there off the, the bottom of the hill. And then D Street uh, seemed like a clear line as well. There were some homes over here on the east side uh, that were more uh, rancher, you know, built in the 60s. And so we did decide to kind of jog around those. But for the most part, you know, we have more of a symmetrical district and also including East City Park um, within the historic district. So. Uh, looking at the National Register nomination process, um, we had gone through, and these were the significant changes between uh, the 1980 district and the one today. Um, the period of significance, so all the properties that still retain their character within this time frame uh, are included within the contributing category of the district. Uh, it used to be 1930, and so um, we've expanded it a little bit to post-war uh, 1940. And so that brought in kind of these colonials and uh, bungalows that you didn't see in the previous nomination. Uh, contributing building criteria, really the goal of the commission was to be a little bit more tolerant. Um, instead of just sticking strictly with the uh, Secretary of the Interior standards, which are really stringent, um, there's really no modifications you can do unless they're consistent with, with their um, criteria and if you do something that's off then you automatically get you know non-conforming status so we didn't want to be that stringent you know a lot of times uh, houses add, or add dormers at some point in time um, you know those could uh, jeopardize that uh, listing as well we didn't want that to happen metal or vinyl siding sometimes you you know new materials come out and you end up reciting it with those I mean McConnell Mansion has metal siding mm -hmm. and so that that wasn't original and so if we're gonna um, you know really look at uh, the most prominent uh, building within the district and it has metal siding I mean really none of the, the houses wouldn't be included so and then rear side additions really we're just looking at the fo you know focusing on the front of the the structure itself is the most important. I just remember when I was um, as liaison, um, all the garages were having to be. Yeah, and I got that. Uh, yeah, yeah, oh, I'll talk about that. I was just wondering yeah. if that was like that, that maybe it gotten taken out because I remember that was like this. Uh, yeah, that, that, <laughs> that, that's what uh, delayed us uh, so, so long. long. Yeah, oh. yeah. And then the revised district bounty. So those were the, the major changes between the 1980 and the now. Um, we had submitted. Uh, our nomination forms to the State Historic Preservation Office and that happened uh, spring of last year. And then we have uh, Idaho National Register Review Board. They meet once a year now and so uh, we had to wait until fall of last year in order to go before them. And then they had uh, a Secretary of the Interior standard that was coming down from the National Park Service that wasn't a standard now but it will be in the future that they imposed upon us, which is a little odd, but um, so they required us to document all the accessory structures of all the properties within the district. And so, you know, just a, a large undertaking and I, I'll have to give Wendy McClure, the chair of the commission, totally. you know, pretty much all the credit for that because she actually went around in the winter and you know how bad of a winter we had, uh, went around and, and documented 
all the accessory structures on all of these properties. You know, we're talking 240 yeah. plus properties that she had walked around in with snow on the ground and, and done that. So um, talk about a commitment to a commission. Um, I think Wendy uh, deserves a whole lot of credit for that. So um, she had done that over the, the winter 2016-2017. Uh, it went to the National Park Service uh, earlier this year, and it, we just received word that it was officially listed uh, on September 25th of 2017. So um, just to recap, you know, original district contained 116 total sites. We had 70 sites that were contributing to the historic character of that district, and then 46 sites that were non-contributing. So it's about 60% that were contributing previously. And then the amended district, uh, we more than doubled the number of sites, 243. 178 of those were contributing, which is great. You know, you look at 50% uh, or above to be a, a district. And so uh, 65 non-contributing. And so, you know, almost three-quarters of the district is contributing. And I think that probably just speaks to the care that the owners within the district take to preserving their houses and, and uh Really, you know, it, it, recognizing it's a, a special um, honor to be a part of a national registered district. And so I'll just end with this. This is our uh, new district boundary, uh, squeaky clean, and uh, I can answer any questions that you might have. Gary? I have one. Why isn't City Hall within the district? Because um, it's more of a residential and institutional district. So, um, you know, it was originally. City Hall is kind of in between our downtown historic district, which is recognized as commercial. Mm -hmm. um, but really, the the intent of the Fort Russell district is is more of a residential district, and then you have some of those institutional buildings. Even though City Hall is an institutional building, um, it, it's listed on the National Register individually, and so that was that was part of it. You know mm -hmm. that that weighed you know had taken into consideration that. You know, you, you can be part of a district and be on the National Register, but I think it's the ultimate honor to be individually listed uh, on the National Register, and, and so that that was part of it. Okay. And, and does how come the park, which doesn't, I mean, it has some structures on it, but why does the park make it into the historic district just because it became a park? Um, you don't necessarily, you know, there's, a whole bunch of things that can be on the National Register. You know, you can have sites, and that's what this is. It's more of a site than a structure. Um, you know, there there are some houses that aren't necessarily historic, but they're historic because somebody of notoriety lived there. Like I was just in Ketchum and Ernest Hemingway. You know, we went to tour his house. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't to say that the the structure was historic just because of the architecture it was because Ernest Hemingway lived in the house and so um, that's what we have here is is just uh, yeah it's it's a site um, but it contributed to the historic character Fort Russell it was uh, a meeting place that all the residents could could come to and and uh, you know more of an event space than anything and it was parted as platted as part of the park edition uh, which is one of our earliest subdivisions along with uh, the Russell Platt and the Russell uh, Second Edition Platt. And so those were all platted about the same time in the, the late 1880s, and uh, the the park was platted then too. So it, it dates back to the early subdivision plats, and so that's why it's got that historic character. So now that those side buildings had been they actually made the the requirement then, the, the ones that Wendy took all the picture of? The accessory structures? The accessory structures, they ended up uh, giving us a little leeway there. They didn't require us to take pictures. Uh, they just required us to document that the, the structures were there and then to give a, a, um, a judgment as to whether or not they were contributing or non-contributing to the district and so that's what they had done so when people live in those homes if they want to make changes to their homes does it matter well this is real well we like to say is this is an honor not an obligation so you can go wipe out your house tomorrow and we can't say anything about that 
Uh, you can go paint it whatever color you want to paint it. You know, there's there's no really restrictions. Um, and you're, you know, it, it, it's at this point in time where you're listed on the National Register. Uh, they don't go around and monitor those things. You know, if you do an addition, yeah, it could compromise your, your house. But if you're already listed as an, a contributing building on the, the Fort Russell Historic District, um, you're not going to go off anytime soon unless we go back through another amendment yes. in so many years to look at, you know, maybe just expanding it again or um, updating the, the structures. If we've had, a, you know, a lot of structures that have been compromised, you know, maybe we look at doing that. But, uh, I mean, it's been 30-plus years since we originally had this listed. And um, being as though it took four or five years to get through this point, I don't think I'm going to be going back <laughs> and and uh, bringing this up anytime soon. but <laughs> well, I just wondered, too, um, having the larger um, area, does that make a difference when we write grants and things like that? Not that I'm aware of, no. Um, no. So in it, 20 years or so, when this is kind of half facetiously, is there going to be like a 1960s architecture historic yeah, district? Right. <laughs> yeah, technically, if... if uh, you know, I mean, that's the rule of thumb is if it's 50 years old or, or older, uh, it's technically historic. So um, there, there was a lot of, you know, houses that were really neat, um, kind of the area that we jogged around East City Park. I think there's an art deco or art modern maybe um, house over there that's really neat. You know, it's historic. Without a doubt, but it's it doesn't contribute to what Fort Russell was originally intended. So it sounds like if something else comes along, it'd have to be a new definition for a district or something. Yeah, I mean, we'd have to define the period of significance, and it'd have to include the yeah. '60s or you know, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's something to think about. Uh, at some point in the future, I, they're probably reaching that age right now. Those ran, you know, '60s, '70s ranchers. Yeah. They're their own California style. by level. I mean, those you could look at be. Them and you yeah. know what era they're in. Yeah, and I think historic preservation was beginning to think about another area of town and another his type of historic district too. Well, the you know the area south of of Third Street certainly has a lot of uh, you know historic homes intermingled in that area, and that was the area I think that was first developed. You had a larger. A lot large, you know, some larger houses that were more of farmsteads, kind of urban, you know, or first urban agriculture per se. Right. And uh, so they, you know, were looking at maybe possibly that area, maybe not for a district, more or less just to inventory what we had, you know, the assets that we had there. And then they've uh, discussed uh, looking at the campus, you know, U of I campus for for some time as well. There's a, a number of individually listed buildings up there, but. Um, you know that it certainly could be a district, but you know the U of I. We have to talk to the U of I about uh, you know whether or not they wanted that or not. So, yep. cool. This is exciting. I know they, the the commission's got to feel relieved too. There's yeah, it was a lot of a lot of work, and uh, you know it, it quite a few years, and and they're just uh, yeah happy to to have it finally approved by the Park ah, Service. That's and, really cool. And, yep, check check one off our list. So <laughs> exactly. Thank you for presenting. Yep. And I guess we'll see you at the council meeting on the 6th, right? No, no. no. We should, though, or somebody. Don't you think? Somebody from the commission? I mean, after all this year, I mean, well, years of work or something? Then the commission report comes around eventually. I think that's coming up here soon, yeah. so, so we can, we can save highlight it, for then? it during the commission okay. report. Yeah, I think I'm either next month or... November. Yeah, November. Make sure it's highlighted. I will. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank All right. You. With that, yep. um, I'll move to adjourn if you all are ready. Go on. All right, thank you. <laughs>